Good morning, everybody. This is uh, Paul Cramey. Um, today, we're starting a couple of topics that are very dear to my uh, to, to my heart. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing on pricing and pricing evaluation stuff, what to look for. And then on Thursday, we're going to switch gears and look at more of the financial side profitability. Uh, today, they just do some very cursory introductory comments on pricing concepts and pricing methods. And then um, we'll look at some key questions, two or three, four key questions on would a pricing evaluation be helpful? And then why do? And then secondly, we'll, or lastly, we'll look at a sample and we'll hope to spend most of our time there. Um, you know, looking at a, a more real recent example that I uh, with a client. I want to draw your attention. What I've got labeled there is presenter's thoughts. Um, pricing evaluation is, or pricing is handled very differently by by different owners, and it's a complex topic. You have to know the relationship between part costs and part multipliers, as well as looking at uh, a lot of uh, very historical uh, data. And because of the um, because of that complexity and the time involved, this particular um, thing, pricing evalu evaluating your pricing, might best be done on a consultative basis. I want to be very upfront and make sure you're aware of that. Uh, we'll have ample time uh, to talk uh, questions, answer questions. And then lastly, there's a handout posted online that we encourage you to uh, to download, and it'll cover some of the highlight uh, takeaways, so to speak, of uh, of our discussion today. Then at the bottom of the page is the uh, uh, information on how um, how you can reach um, how you can reach me. Uh, I'm going to change the. Um, um, what we're looking at here, just one second. <clears throat> okay, to begin with, just a little background about myself. <clears throat> I retired from my own sign business uh, that I had from 1993, and then I retired in 2003. And uh, starting right after uh, I retired, I started working with uh, with Sirius Software on a uh, uh, as a trainer. Um, um, have done that now since 2003, so it's actually 14, 14, 15 years. Um, back in 2009, <clears throat> I started doing some independent uh, consulting work, and that came about um, as a result of. Uh, uh, some speaking engagements at, uh, at a sign conference, a couple of sign conferences. I was involved in uh, developing the data set, product data set for the predecessor um, uh, software from Sirius called SMS. And then um, shortly thereafter, when con control was really beginning to evolve uh, and become widely used, I developed the initial set of uh, multiplier values that had their um, that were entered in into control. Now the world has changed dramatically since that beginning, and the multipliers that were very reasonable, very competitive uh, several years ago, um, time has gone by, and that's not necessarily the case. Now. How have I found my client base? Who who are the people that I work with? Where have um, I've done it from um, uh, re referrals from the Sirius Software uh, technical staff and consultants when they find customers that have some con express some concerns about their pricing, they will refer me to them. Um, I have my own website and I get. Uh, a request for information, the website itself. 
Now, on the pricing evaluation side, I have done, I've worked with 16 clients to date, and we've done uh, 18 uh, completed engagements, and another one is just about ready to, uh, to begin. I'll just comment quickly on the financial analysis side that we'll go explore on, uh, in detail on Thursday. I've worked with 24 clients there, and we've done, I've done 32 engagements. Now, what I want to do from here is to um, um, just do some quick reviewing uh, to kind of set the stage for, for the bulk of what we want to talk about. Just some very simple pricing concepts. Obviously, price is what you're going to charge to the customer. Your costs or your production costs, 700 bucks in this example, and your gross profit is 500. We're going to be talking about those three relationships. Now, in control, you can do pricing only, which does not include uh, and base any of the pricing on cost. You can use a combination of pricing and costing. And cost pricing and costing is a better combination because it will give you a far better view of your profitability. Serious supports the control software supports a, a large number of different pricing methods. I'm only going to highlight the two main ones: area-based pricing and cost-based pricing. And you can see from the different columns there, uh, area-based pricing, you got a per square foot price. It's, it's sensitive to quantity. There may be setup charges on a per piece or a per job basis, and you may or may not charge for scrap. Some of its strengths are it's relatively simple, and historically, it has a long established uh, baseline in the industry. Its weaknesses, uh, it's not really um, uh, suitable to large jobs. Uh, there's very little, if any, relationship to costs. Keep in mind that the earlier point of sales uh, software systems, they were product based. They had no sensitivity whatsoever you know, to the cost of uh, what it costs you to produce them. And then speaking from experience, there's a tendency to not keep your uh, your pricing updated as your internal costs uh, change. Cost-based pricing, on the other hand, um, it's subject to the what you're consuming, what is required to produce the final product. So you got material costs, you got equipment costs, you got print printer activities, you got labor costs, and you got markups or multipliers. And you'll probably catch me using those last two words, markup and multiplier, um, um, interchangeably. They're really one and the same thing. The strengths of cost-based pricing is it's more accurate. That it's more accurate if and only if your costs are accurate in, in the, uh, that you've captured in each of the parts. It's a little bit more detailed to get it set up. Uh, it may be frustrating to keep it sensitive to market pricing, and that's the essence of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, other methods that I'll just, you know, there for you to see, but I'm not going to, uh, to comment on. Now, how, how area-based pricing works, uh, you got your substrate, coroplast, PVC, wood, whatever it is. You're going to multiply that by the number of square feet that's involved and that becomes the base price. You may add a, a separate charge based on the scrap that's involved. That's also done on a square foot basis. It's usually a lesser value than the substrate charge, but it, you may or may not uh, use that scrap uh, element. You may or may not use setup charges. Uh, historically, when, when I was using software, I had a one-time setup charge and I had a per piece setup charge, both very small. And then a percent of, um, you know, based on quality, based on the on the resolution or the, the quality of the, it's an upcharge of that factor. You may charge for a second side. So the sum of all of those equals the uh, pre-tax price. Cost-based pricing, 
you got all of your different, uh, you got your substrate costs, um, and you're going to multiply that by the amount that's consumed. And then that's going to be multiplied by the this multiplier or this markup value to give you the price of the substrate. The ink is the same. The labor is the same and so on and so forth. Again, it's the sum of all of these then that gives you the, uh, you know, the pre-tax base price. So as you, could, as you can see from this very simple chart that every part has a multiplier, everyone. Many of the parts, mostly in the equipment area and in the uh, labor area, uh, will use a default. Um, but the, the substrate items, they will tend to um, uh, have uh, a, a what's referred to as a custom uh, markup or a custom multiplier. So some important, important concepts before we really jump in in, in detail. Um, pricing, your pricing must be profitable, but at the same time, it has to be competitive. And finding that balance is the challenge. Your costs must be accurate. Um, if they're not, if they're too low, if they're too high, they're too high, you're likely going to be uh, overpricing. You're, you're like, likely to push yourself beyond competitiveness. But whether, regardless of what the cost is, if the multipliers are, are functioning as you as they are int intended, your margin will stay relatively the same. So if you're too expensive, it might be because of the cost. It might be because of the, of the multiplier value. And then ultimately, the profitability, how you manage and control the, the profitability is primarily through the multiplier values. So the challenge is, uh, in the evaluation is looking at what your pricing, what your multipliers are, and then um, um, going from there, okay? Now, would a pricing evaluation be helpful? That's the key question. Look at some important questions that I have found in the clients that I have worked with. Are your part costs or your part multipliers over a year old? Has it been that long since you've updated either or both of them? Would a better way of getting pulp multiplier values be helpful? I'll elaborate on that as we as we go further. <clears throat> and then lastly, do you have concerns about your gross margins? Or do you feel they're too high? You feel they're too low? Then if you answered yes to any of these three questions, then there's a distinct possibility that a pricing evaluation would be helpful. What's the objective of a pricing evaluation? Um, twofold. We want to improve your gross margins. And secondly, we want to uh, present a, a uh, simpler, more simplified way of managing the ongoing maintenance of the multipliers. And what are the benefits of, a, of, a, of a, an evaluation? You'll see and as we go through the samples that you're going to get an updated uh, view of uh, what the current multipliers are by the part categories and what the recommended multipliers would be. And those recommended multipliers are based on uh, achieving a, uh, an increase or an adjustment in your, in your gross margins. And what are the deliverables? What do you get? First and foremost, you get an implementation guide. How do you up, how do you set up control to uh, to implement some of the recommended changes from a multiplier perspective? You're going to get a narrative assessment, and then you're going to get a fairly uh, detailed set of um, of um, uh, reports. What are the steps involved in evaluation? First, we gather your part data. It's exported out of control. That's going to be the parts uh, for labor, equipment, material, outsource, miscellaneous, all of the different parts types. Secondly, we're going to capture a, uh, a pre preferably a year's sample of uh, historical data 
uh, at the order level. And that historical data uh, has the invoice number, the, uh, the company that's involved in all of the line items, all of the parts that are consumed, what the cost of those are, and then the, uh, ultimately the price. And then we're going to look at the we'll talk about and capture some stuff on the gross margin targets. What is it now? And what would you like it to be? All three of those uh, user data components then are imported into the model that I have created. And the results of that model produce the narrative assessment. The implementation guide were pretty static in nature. And then the analysis itself produces uh, a very comprehensive set of five reports. The one at the part type level, part type that head control has their equipment, freight, labor, um, overhead, material, miscellaneous, and outsource. Then there's a, another report that's going to be at the, at the multiplier level, showing you what they are today and what they ought to be to achieve the gross margin targets. And then I found in doing some of the, uh, looking at the historical data, there are two phenomena that, uh, that have a dramatic, dramatic effect on the reliability of your, of your margins. One is if you don't, this applies particularly to the use of the miscellaneous and outsourced products. If you don't capture the cost, correctly, then you're going to have a significant impact potentially on the gross margins. You may, you'll overstate it. We'll, we'll look at examples of, of that. Secondly, if the prices are significantly overridden, or if there are some anomalies in the way the parts and modifier, multipliers are working, you may in fact see some negative gross margins, big red flag. That's bad news if you, if you see that. And unfortunately, I, I see it in almost all, of the, uh, almost all of the evaluations. So let's get ready to jump in and look at a, an evaluation. So the, uh, we're gonna look at the source data. We're gonna look at the gross margins based on the uh, actual history. And then we're looking for anomalies, looking for things that just jump out that uh, from a kind of an analytical view, raise a red flag. And that's going to be fake focusing on costs, multipliers, prices that are produced, and gross margins that are produced. And what are you going to see? You are, I'm going to warn you ahead of time you are going to see a large, large number of numbers, values. Don't be spooked. I have highlighted those items that are, uh, I think are anomalies and ones that will need to be explored. So that's, that's, that's gonna be our focus. Now I'm gonna need to change uh, documents here just a second. Paul, this yes. is Linda. Can you just yes. let everybody know that there's a handout available that they should um, print out and take a look at? Yeah, that's going to help it. them follow uh, right. the rest of this session. If you look at the, um, I did over at the beginning of our time, but if you look on the go to webinar website or the uh, control box under handouts, there is a handout for today's session. That I encourage you to, um, you know, to uh, um, download, and then there's one. There will be one for Thursday session as well. And as we get into what you're seeing here, the items that I have color coded are the ones that are highlighted as the takeaways, then that are alluded to in the handout. So yes, there's a huge no amount of numbers here. Don't don't let that scare you. I will focus on the things that I that I have found that are in this engagement that are of concern. So let's start at the top of the page. 
this top section uh, highlights the historical data. So in this case, there was uh, um, 1,500 orders, six, almost 1,600 orders. The costs are there, the price is there, straight out of control, no manipulation of the data whatsoever. And the highlights that are in yellow are the ones with negative gross margins. You can see it's 30, 60, it's over 200 orders out of the 1,500. Those may occur because of overriding the price. They may occur because there is an anomaly in how one or more parts are working. And it may be a result of uh, you generated an estimate based on a certain volume. And then you parse that out during the course of the year, but didn't override or recalculate the price, the, the cost and, and the price. So you may see the cost based on what it would have been if you had done all at the same time, contrasting that with how you're doing it as you step it along. If you have that that pattern of business, that's very typical. But then it might be appropriate for you to look at using um, the, the mechanism in control where you can uh, price and put stuff into inventory based on the entire project and then pull it out as you as you parse through it. So the big thing on this one is we're going to focus on the uh, the negative gross margins with the client. And then down at the very bottom on the last one, you'll notice that there's 27 orders that had no cost whatsoever for $74,000 out of the 1.6 million. Uh, it's not a huge percentage, but the, Bob, the effect on the gross margin is a zero cost, in essence, is a 100% gross margin. We all know that that's highly unlikely that you're gonna have that. So the overall gross margin for this for this particular client on the uh, 1.6 million in sales was 40.3 percent. That's adversely affected by those the negative ones, and it's it's overstated minimally by the ones that are that are no cost. Now I'm going to scroll down, and we're going to look at the next uh, section itself. This is a summary of at the part type level. Control always has the same set of part types, equipment, freight, labor, overhead, material, other, and outsource. And what I've captured here and I have highlighted are the total costs, what the calculated um, uh, cost base price would be purely using the part costs and the multipliers that are involved and that produces the, the current price. Now, the first one is highlighted in the uh, equipment area. If you look, simply look at the relationship between the cost, the 82,000 and the 238,000 based on the price, that's, that's a huge markup. It's probably not realistic. So that's the first red flag. The next report that we look at, will begin to zero in on what part categories maybe are contributing to that anomaly. Down in the, um, in the labor area, costs of 516,000 out of a total cost of 565, highly unlikely. Something is, something is wacky in the, in the labor costs. So that'll be the third, second piece that we'll look at in more detail. Coming down to the outsource, notice that the cost and the price is the same. That's because this client had his outsource multiplier, default multiplier set to one. No markup whatsoever. So he's, sell, he's implying that he's selling at cost. The interesting thing is that as you're using the miscellaneous or the outsourced products, you have the opportunity to put in the markup or just simply enter the cost. Whether throughout the engagements that I've worked done, it's very common 
to simply not update the cost or not adjust the multiplier beyond what the default is. So if the default is one for no markup, that's the way it's going to price. Kind of this bottom piece is a, is what I refer to as a normalized view of the of this, and I look at that because primarily from a cost perspective, fifty four cents out of every dollar is labor. That's this one up here at the top, the five hundred and seventeen thousand. So something in the labor is is wacko because this is not consistent with the patterns that I normally see. Coming down a little bit deeper. Now we're going one level deeper in the um, in the uh, at the part category level. So within equipment, he has these six or seven different uh, part categories that are involved. And if you look at the digital large format printers, his cost was twenty one thousand, but the price based on the multipliers was 129,000. Something is wacky in the digital format printer multipliers the way they're set up. That's what jumps out at this uh, on this particular item. We'll look at the multipliers on the next slide that we look at. Coming down into the uh, into the labor component. The two items that I need to draw attention to are the service labor and the installation. Just having almost half of their labor absorbed in, in uh, service and installation just doesn't seem right. So it warrants conversation with that client to explore, to see if there's something that's, that's out of line and why that is the, uh, is the case. The relationship between the cost and the price is not particularly alarming. Uh, we'll see on the next uh, report that we look at that their multiple, their default multipliers, um, I think, are, are on the low side. Equipment is one and a half. Labor is one and a half. Um, my experience is that that's on the low side. Uh, but the relationship between the cost and the and the price for service and insulation doesn't concern me. It's only the cost. Now, this particular client had a very serious, uh, not with a C, but with an S, a very serious issue with their finishing labor and the way that part had been um, had been somehow altered. That part was a, had been a um, had been attached to products that it shouldn't have been, such as miscellaneous product, such as the outsourced product. So if you, he was using the miscellaneous product with a quantity of 100, for example, because that part was attached inappropriately, the, it interpreted that quantity, 100, as 100, as 100 hours. So you can see it was just, it was just raising havoc with their prices. And I, I, overrode a lot of that, but I wasn't able to get it completely eliminated. Uh, so there's still some concern on that uh, on that finishing labor. I'm just going to jump down to the outsource. You know, here um, you can just see that all of these are traveling at the with no markup, uh, modest, modest markup on the other up here at the top. But these the, the red flag here is that that it's, it's concerning uh, to me that the markup is um, is no higher than it is. On the, now we're getting into the uh, viewing of the multipliers. So in each section for equipment, labor, et cetera, the little green guy here is the current default. Freight, so all the way down, one and a half, one and a half, one and a half for labor. Um, Material. I've, I'm not look. We're not looking at all of this, but uh, now this next section here within equipment. These are the different part categories over here. Look at the printers, large format printers. 
He's got three printers in that category. They have an average multiplier of 6.11. Something is inappropriate. He's either grossly understated the cost or he's just artificially inflating the, the multiplier values. So that requires looking very seriously at those three printers to find out why and then make the adjustment. Notice that uh, uh, some of these are um, using the default and some are not. Historically, what I found is that in the uh, equipment area, very, very few uh, part categories use a custom multiplier. Very few do. But he's got a wide range of uh, use in the default, below the default, above the default, and then way above the default. Freight almost always is in that one and a quarter to one and a half range. Nothing is of concern there. When we get down into the uh, labor, um, the miscellaneous uh, was above. Here on, on the labor, typically the vast majority of the labor parts use the default because they are likely more the ones that are involved in the production process. What I see and what I advocate to, to, my, to the clients that I work with is that the value added labor components for installation, for service, for design, those are value added items that typically I perceive should be priced above the default level. How far above depends on, on your, uh, how competitive you can be in your particular uh, in your particular area, Paul, we do have a question before you go okay. any further. Then, um, I'll we have stop here so I can drink some coffee. Okay, we have a question from Lynn, and it's where do you get your target pricing? And Lynn, I've unmuted you. If you have a mic, the target pricing up here. Um, yes. That's a good question, Lynn, and I probably should have expanded that beforehand. At the very top here, the in the green, the 54.7413, I when I take your historical data and the parts, I separate those into three broad categories. Things that you fabricate in-house here, that's this middle one right here in the middle of the page, right here. Um, whoops. Then labor, that's the service, that's the installation, and the miscellaneous and outsource. The current price values that you see here, those are based on the current multipliers exactly the way they exist in control. The target price, that comes back up to here where I'll have a dialogue with the client and say, okay, this is where we are in the fabricated section. You have 54.7% gross margin based on pure cost-based pricing. What is a reasonable growth that you would like to see? So this particular client said, I'd like to see that jump to 56. Their labor, they'd like to see go from the 13.3 to 15. Miscellaneous is gonna go up a bunch because we want to get them off of that, um, that one-time markup. So the target is based on dialogue with the client, uh, looking at where their current gross margins are and where they would like them to be. Does that make sense, Lynn? Yep, I understand what you're saying. Okay, but good question, thank you. Okay. Two more little pieces here. This report here, uh, um, and for this particular client, unfortunately, was 35 pages long. And what it is simply saying is that, hey, client, at least one item, one line item in that order 
has either no cost or the number of units was not specified. So it's a it's a red flag that says, hey, client, look at these orders and see if you can determine if it's a if it's a procedural issue that you're not entering the number of units primarily for miscellaneous and outsource uh, uh, part products, or if you're just simply not entering the cost or neither of them. So this is nothing more than an FYI. Please take a look at these and, and see if you can determine why there are so many that are um, that have no no parts or uh, no units or costs. This report here um, is is pretty lengthy as well for this particular client client because they have a lot of a lot of, they had fifteen hundred orders. And here we've simply sorted it based on the lowest to largest gross margin. So obviously, the ones that we want them to pay attention to are these that have a negative um, a negative gross margin. Again, it's an FYI. Please explore. See if there is a, if a potential uh, anomaly that has to be addressed by one of the uh, by one of the serious consultants, perhaps. Maybe it's something that you have done inadvertently that uh, that would need to be adjusted, or if it's a procedural matter. Okay. So again, this is an FYI report. Now, every pricing evaluation, I produce a a narrative report. I'm not going to highlight any of this. I'm just going to scroll through so you can get a flavor <coughs> of what's involved. This kind of a kickoff session, a review, you know, the data range that we looked at, what they what their targets were for changes in, in the gross margin, uh, I, uh, hopefulness. Now, as we get down into this area here, I'm going to begin to focus on observations okay so in this particular section i am trying to draw their attention to things that i think they need to take a look at so again it's it's a point i'm pointing them uh into uh looking at their operation and see if something needs to be adjusted keep them keep going down um Nothing more there. This is the guide to implementation. Uh, now one of the things that I have alluded to at the very beginning, we want to also find a way to simplify how they manage part multipliers. As you're well aware that every single part has a multiplier. multiplier. It's either going to be assigned to the default or it's going to be assigned a, as a custom multiplier. Currently, if it's a custom multiplier, the value is contained in that part. It might be three, it might be three and a half, it might be six. What we're after to simplify the maintenance uh, of multiplier is to take and look at the multipliers within a category at an average level. So all of your parts that are corrugated, for example, or corrugated plastic, they will probably tend to have the same multiplier. So what the, the simplification for ongoing maintenance amounts to is to use a, the uh, user constants within control and set up a, a set of user constants for the different part categories. So you might have one for corrugated plastic, you would have one for PVC, you would have one for wood, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You, in those user constants, you put the value that you want that multiplier to be. And that when you would, to do that, we would use that, that multiplier report to get the current and to get the, the, uh, the recommended one. Then on a one-time basis, you edit the parts within that category. 
and tell that part to use the user constant. So from that day forward, if you need to adjust the multiplier for competitive reasons, for your corrugated plastic or for your PVC, you make one change to the user constant, then all of the parts that use that that uh, user constant will will be updated at the same time. So it's a this is the simplifi simplification of the maintenance uh, that's a focus. These are the detailed instructions on how you do that within control. And that's the end of my my spiel. Um, questions, please. Any other questions? I'm going to down. I'm going to uh, open up the um, um, handout so you can kind of see. Hang on a second. Just bear with me. I don't see any questions, Paul. Okay. Okay, this is the uh, there we go. enlarge this a little bit. This is the the um, handout. Well, let me take it back to, I can't enlarge it um, with the uh, go-to webinar, but this is the, I've highlighted the areas that are concerned, that we're concerned about, and then some observations down here. This is the next section, focusing on these three that we talked about, and then observations, uh, the multipliers, um, this is the next level down. Then we looked at the uh, the culprit in the large format printers, the two labor items that we talked about, and then the observations. You know, there, the multipliers, the ones with no cost, and the, lastly, the ones with um, with a, a obnoxious gross margin. If anybody is wants more, um, has more questions that they would feel more comfortable talking about uh, privately, please uh, let me know. Uh, my email is paul, P-A-U-L, at the letter P, Kramme, K-R-A-M-M-E, consulting.com. Might be easier to, uh, to call at 515. 360-9882. We do have two questions, Paul. All right, good. Um, um, I have from Nalana. I have some problems with area-based and cost-based price. I will unmute you. And if you have a microphone. Nalana. Nalana, can you hear us? <clears throat> uh, can you hear us, Nalana? I've unmuted your microphone if you have one. <laughs> oh, okay. She doesn't have she doesn't have it. Okay, her question is some problems with area based and cost based. Um can you elaborate on that? That's <clears throat> they're never they are very ever different. Going, they're what never you ever they're yeah they're never ever thing never. Um, and that's because the the cost based pricing is looking at every single part that is needed to produce what it is that you're producing. So it's going to take the part 
It's going to look at the consumption, the cost. It's going to use the appropriate multiplier, and that's the price. Area-based pricing, if your costs and the parts are captured, you will see what the cost is. But the costs do not have any impact on what the price is. And where it gets challenging is that the same material, let's just pick PVC as an example. PVC within that part, if you look at the details of that, you're gonna see the cost and it's gonna be the same cost, whether it's in a cost-based pricing or an area-based pricing. But then in one of the other UDFs, there are separate area-based parameters if that part was used in a flatbed printer or for off of a flatbed printer for cut vinyl for a roll printer for screen printing the values are different and the that, that value is going to indirectly include the allocation for labor an allocation for equipment and perhaps other things that would be used to produce that price. So you're never going to achieve the same pricing between the two the, between the two pieces. You simply need to look if you're bouncing back and forth between the two, which you can do, look at the gross margin for each of them. And if you see a wide swing between the two, that's going to be your red flag and which one is probably the most reliable. And my gut would tell me that it's going to be the cost-based pricing. Area-based pricing, um, it, it's, it's easier, to, easier to understand and it's easier to probably think in terms of talking to a client. Oh, it's about $3 a square foot. But be very, very careful with that because the pricing is, is, is not going to be linear. It's going to vary as quantities and sizes differ. And area-based pricing has a more difficult time being uh, accurate and across all of those um, all of those components. Paul, we do have a couple other questions. Sure, good. Okay. Um, next is David, and David, I've unmuted you. Um, I have interest in sales costs and how you show this. I'm not sure, David, can you? I have an interest in. Actually, I'm printing out right now some, uh, some of these forms I found here, financial analysis handout, valuation handout. So I don't know if my printer is going to override me. I was just wondering, uh, just trying to look at some of your percentage numbers, and I didn't see anything about your accounting for sales. Do you have that in a separate category, or are you just assuming a certain amount of sales costs, placing it in your multiplier? Uh, I'm, you mean like uh, overhead costs, David? Yeah, right, yeah. I, I think okay. when I look at your numbers, I sort of added up what I thought you were showing me through numbers like 15% labor target, material cost labor 20%. That brought me to my 35%. You were showing me 34, an example. Then I'm thinking, well, maybe sales costs are 15 and it gets you to the 50% mark. I just don't realize. I'm just trying to look at your relationship numbers on it. When, when, we, when we get into Thursday's topic mm -hmm. for the financial analysis, yes, we're going to hit hard on the the labor piece of it the the default value that's in control when the system is initially delivered is set at 45 dollars an hour okay is that going to be an exact number for everybody absolutely not that number needs to include an allocation for overhead what's it cost you to unlock the doors every morning the wages paid for the production personnel yes and the taxes and the benefits vacation 
and, and right. vacation and vacation allocate. Yes, insurance and all those things. Now, right? when we get in, when we get into Thursday's discussion, you're going to see how I produce those numbers. Surprisingly enough, based on the 30 plus um, engagements I've done for financial analysis, um, there's not a huge swing from one client to the next on the overhead piece, on the tax piece, and on the wages. The $45 is pretty typical in what I'm seeing. I've seen some that have crept up into the $50, $55 a, a range, and I've seen a few that are below that. Um, but the, the typical overhead piece that I'm seeing will range from $20 to $28 an hour. The taxes are in the five to the taxes and benefits, with some exceptions, are in the five to the six dollar, seven dollar range. And then the wages paid, including overhead and any other, uh, you know, compensation that the, that they get, is going to be the rest of it. And that's going to range from, uh, um, well, I can't do my arithmetic backwards, <laughs> twenty to twenty twenty dollars an hour range. We'll hit, okay. we'll hit this, David, a lot more on, on Thursday. Okay, great. Didn't mean to jump the gun on you here. I was just, no. The, um, I was a little the, lost in the weed here for all, all these things, but I, I kind of look at you know, the other side of the picture here. The, um, the, these, the pricing evaluation and the financial analysis are related to each other in a sense but yet they are completely independent of each other. I have some people that begin with looking at their pricing first. I have some people that say, I want to make sure that my labor costs are properly calculated and, and uh, used in, in, in control. So they will begin with the financial side. Okay. Thank the financial you. side, as an interim step where when we get pretty much to the end of that engagement, we can immediately make adjustments to control for the labor side. The rest of the financial analysis is a longer term um, pattern or path to improve profitability because you have to contain costs. And I, I don't want to I don't want to focus on that right, you know, today, but that's, that's the difference. So pricing will focus on the, uh, on the, on the setting, making immediate changes, you know, that affect your pricing on the financial side, we can adjust the labor and then we, the rest of it is going to be longer term in nature. Thank you very much. That, yeah. Does that help? Have... Yes. Yes. I'm glad we're going to go to that next on Thursday. I'll yes. be there. Bells off. <laughs> awesome. All right. We have another question um, from Barry, and I'll unmute you, Barry. Uh, let's see. Right. Okay. Barry's question is Are you getting the information from Sirius Reporting System and specifically the summary schedules you showed us? The Going back to the um, um, sample here, just a second. I'm trying to get back to where I was. Hang on a second. The all of the all of the data that is used to produce the evaluation, 100% of it comes from control. It's just a simple export of the parts, and it's a simple export of a standard report from control. It's called part usage. 
that last file is huge. I've seen it up in the 50, 60,000 rows. The parts Paul, are smaller. Paul, would it be helpful for you? Do you have control open? No, but I can open it pretty quick. To show everybody where they can find that part usage report. Don't run it because it could be huge. Um, but just show everybody where to find that report that you're referring to. Great idea. It's going to take me a second here to open it up. Barry, did you find it? Did I hear you say? No, I just said uh, that's a great idea. Okay. <laughs> All right. Just give us one second, folks. <clears throat> okay, you should be seeing control, everybody. You seeing control, Linda? No, we're not seeing control. Oh, now we are. Okay, we're, okay. we're good. <clears throat> okay, so to get the, let's go to the reports. Um, it's under reports. Um, down under parts and inventory. Uh, usage reports, usage by type. I'm going by memory, uh, Barry said. <clears throat> this one is kind of short. Um, that's not the one I want. Um, Well, it's, I still don't have the right one, Barry. Uh, it's, it's a part usage report. I can, uh, I, I've got your email. I can send you which, what that is, but it's basically, it, it takes it down to the order level. So I see the, all of the orders and then all of the parts that are used and it shows the estimated uh, cost and then the price. Okay. So all of that comes out of that standard, standard report. The only thing that I do differently is that I have you produce it in a, in a uh, um, CSV format so that I can import the data into, uh, into the model. But it's a standard, standard report. Um, I just I apologize. My mind is blank on which, which one it is. Um, Paul, maybe, um you could uh, research that and we can let everybody know on Thursday. Yeah, good idea. Sorry about that, Barry. No problem. Too many things oh. to read. Here we, here we go. This, this is coming closer. Yeah, this is kind of a, this is the one that can be incredibly long. Okay. So one of the things that you're seeing here is that the invoice level, um, it shows the price and then the estimated cost. The one that I'm talking about takes it at the in, 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 at the order level and then the part detail within that. So I see and, and gather, gather all of the parts uh, for a particular order. And uh, then the pricing that I produce simply looks at the part, sees what the cost is and applies it to the current multiplier or to the target one as we're going forward. But I'll, I'll tell you what the, on Thursday, on Thursday, what that report is and show you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Other questions, comments? I don't see any more questions, Paul. I had we timed it pretty good, almost exactly an hour. I had no idea how long we might be. Sincerely, people, I hope that this has been 
uh, uh, informative to you um, and more important than uh, informative, but helpful. Um, if you'd like any other um, conversation, you know, privately, you know, please reach out to me um, and let me know. And I'd be glad to, you know, to discuss things further with you. We're serious consulting and we can forward it on to Paul. Okay. All right. Thanks, Thank you, Paul. everybody. Thanks, yeah, we'll, we'll talk talk to you on Thursday. Bye bye.